I was hoping to get this over with before you started the tuning. Okay. Uh, thank you again so much for coming out for this Tuesday talk. Some of you have been here for quite a few of the talks, and I thank you. Uh, my name is George Davis. I'm with, on the BIMI Board of Directors, and it's my pleasure tonight to welcome you to the last Tuesday talk of the summer. Maybe not the last talk of the year, but certainly the last talk of the summer. Sorry, I, I should have this memorized, but I don't. BIMI's mission is to provide educational experiences and hands-on exploration to inspire appreciation and preservation of the extraordinary saltwater environment around Block Island. And tonight we welcome Rick Carney, a true pioneer in the field of aquaculture. In fact, when he started, it wasn't even called aquaculture. It was before then, which amazed me to hear that. His Tuesday talk is entitled, We Spawn Millions, Shellfish Culture on Martha's Vineyard. Let's listen, learn, and hear stories from a lifelong shellfish advocate and with some lessons for us here on Block Island. Before we start, we'd like to acknowledge Deadeye Dix, who once again provided a very nice pre-talk dinner for the speaker and some of us. And please consider a donation to BIMI either online or in the donation box on the, black, on the back table to help us continue our mission. Rick is the Director Emeritus of the Martha's Vineyard Shellfish Group, otherwise known as MVSG, and served as its shellfish biologist and director for 41 years. They are a nonprofit consortium of the shellfish departments of six towns on Martha's Vineyard, and they annually produce millions of native quahog, and I think this is native quahog, native base scallop, and native oyster seed to enhance their recreational and commercial fisheries. He also was awarded the Gulf of Maine Visionary Award back in 2001 for demonstrating that shellfish aquaculture can be an environmentally and economically sustainable activity for coastal communities. We are truly pleased, I know I am, because he made the trip from Martha's Vineyard today and he's never been to Block Island before. So please give him a Block Island welcome tonight. Dead Eye Dixon. I'm, I had a drink, so <laughs> I'm loose. Um, that's it. Okay. Uh, again, my name is Rick Carney. Um, I came greetings from a sister island, Martha's Vineyard. Um, I've never been to Block Island. This is a first, and um, it's a great place. What I saw of it. Um, uh, people I talk with. Basically, same kind of issues we have with the crowds and the changes and blah, blah, blah. And um, I think what's really important is that, um, at least on the vineyard, one of the th important things about shellfish is it's, it's, it's something that people have done there forever. And there's kind of this like love-hate relationship with the tourists and whatever. And the islanders kind of supported our program because they, they see it as like, well, you know, we, we can be independent, we have done this, we can have a sustainable island. And that's one of the reasons I think they supported me all these years. But, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit tonight about, um, basically we have this um, shellfish management program and I work with the six towns. Um, we, um, we do a lot of things, kind of technical assistance with the management of the shellfish, but the most important thing we do is run a shellfish hatchery. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the operation of the shellfish hatchery. So that's what this talk is gonna be about. And let's just start it. And my, I guess I'm standing in the right place. Um, <clears throat> George told me I should, oh, George told me I should have some sort of a slide and a, and a, and a, a title to kind of get people excited. So. For any of you that have just come to want to see saucy seashells or uh, clams on the half shell and some spawning pictures, there you go. But um, 
This is a female um, uh, cohog releasing eggs, and there's a male there. And this won't be too X-rated. And there's no steamers. <laughs> okay, a little bit of, again about the shellfish group quickly. We're a nonprofit consortium of the six towns, uh, the, the six actually shellfish departments on Martha's Vineyard. That's who my board is, plus a selectman from each town. We're based out of a solar hatchery that we built in 1980. Um, back in 1980, that was actually one of our first energy crises. If, if people can remember back that far, I don't know. I think there's some people old enough here remember that. But remember the gas lines and, you know, and solar was really big or alternative energy. And we developed the, the hatchery at that point. It has a greenhouse upstairs where we grow the algae under passive, um, well, passive heat from the, from the um, sun and also um, the light that, that produces the photosynthesis. Um, that produces the algae. And then on the middle floor, we have the four plate collectors, which were the old kinds of collectors that you used to put on your house if you wanted hot water. And this was before photovoltaics, so there were no photovoltaics in this thing. Um, but we, we were probably the first public um, solar-assisted shellfish hatchery in, in the country. So that was kind of exciting. Um, so the hatchery produces... We work with the, the species that are most important to the vineyard commercially and recreationally, which are cohogs, um, bay scallops, and, co and, and uh, oysters. Um, and um, in 1995, we did some, um, with some federal funding, we were able to initiate a private aquaculture program, and we started a training program for some fishermen that were out of work because they had closed down George's Bank. And um, we started out with 15 trainees, about five of them stuck with it. Um, once they started to get um, successful, everybody else jumped on board. We, we have about 30 active farms now on the island. They were, it's amazing. I mean, that's one of the proudest things I'm, I have about what I've done on the vineyard was to create these, these jobs in, in the private aquaculture sector on the oyster farms. And because we, you know, if the water quality isn't there, the shellfish can't grow. We can, we can grow as much seed as we want, but if we don't have clean water to put it in and for it to thrive, it's, you know, we're wasting our time. So we do spend a lot of time on water quality project, uh, projects, um, especially, you know, nitrogen pollution, eutrophication, that, you know, that's from septic systems and runoff and from acid rain and all those issues. So we try to address some of those too. I'm going to go this, through this pretty quickly and then maybe we'll just hold the questions till the end. So a little bit about how we started. We didn't really have much. I, I came to the vineyard. I, I, I was a technician down at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science where we were doing um, bay scallop aquaculture. And we were like probably maybe one or two places in the country that had some federal funds to kind of get this started. Um, so they wanted basically somebody to help out with the shellfish on the island, but especially the bay scallops. And that's how I got the job. And basically had my salary, and that was about it. In 1976, with kind of dump cleanings and some um, volunteer help, we put up this, a little greenhouse and a wet lab. By 1977, we made it a little bit more permanent. Um, in 1978, we added another floor, a little pilot hatchery, and we were successful in producing quite a number of shellfish out of just that little facility that led to the funding for the solar-assisted hatchery in 1980. Give you some idea on... Um, on what our production figures, it changes from year to year. This is some numbers from 2015, but we produced about 10 million cohogs. It's a tiny facility, um, of, of, you know, 17.8 million uh, scallop seed, bigger seed, and then we release eggs and larvae, um, and the, you know, big numbers there. Um, and then we also grow oysters, both single ones and spat on shell. And we release eggs. And then that year we did a lot of work with, um, with blue mussels. And again, uh, some of the benefits of a small hatchery is that we can use local uh, brood stock. So one of the th things that we're concerned about is that when, it, when, my, when I proposed to do this hatchery, the, the government, the, the federal program or plan was that from a standpoint of efficiency, we'd, there would be one or two very huge hatcheries in the United States that would produce all the seed selfish for everybody else. And we tried to argue the fact that... Um, you know, it would be better for us to work with local genetic stocks that are fit to our environment. 
so that was one of the arguments we, we took. And, and then also, you know, there's, there are a lot of shellfish diseases, not that are going to affect people, but are going to affect shellfish. And if, and, if, and if you were to, there were some big hatchery somewhere, one of the big ones in the country, that had a disease issue, it could be shut down, and on top of it, it could spread the disease throughout the country or whoever's, you know, getting the seed. I mean, you have to have it tested, but there's always a possibility that there could be a problem. So that's one of the benefits. And I've spoken, you know, since these early days to people who are uh, shellfish pathologists, you know, people who look at the diseases, and they all agree that this is, you know, it makes, it makes good sense to have something on a local level. <clears throat> and then, as I said, we have the solar hatchery is the main kind of the, the, you know, the main building that we work out of. But we have also a nursery on Chappaquiddick, on another island just off of Edgartown. Um, and that's basically a place where we just have tanks that we pump water through and, and the shellfish eat the natural food in the water. And then the, uh, the state lobster hatchery, um, which ran from about, geez, probably like 1945 or something or whatever it started, um, this, it was run by the state of Massachusetts, and they kind of got out of the, or, or the lobster business because the, the water was getting too warm for lobsters. They didn't grow very well anymore. So um, we were offered that facility to rent, and we, we've been renting it now for about uh, 10 or 12 years. And we're starting to expand. Um, we're not growing lobsters there. We're growing the same, you know, the same shellfish, the bivalve shellfish that we do in the other facilities. But it's, it's much larger, and the potential for us to do, be doing a lot more is... Um, is it, you know, it, 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 it has the potential. And again, it always comes down to staff. <coughs> Excuse me. So actually, um, to run a shellfish hatchery, there's a, a couple of parts you've got to put together. And because shellfish pretty much eat live food, before you can even think about growing them, you have to grow their food. And they, they eat microscopic algae. So we have to have an algal culture going. Once we can get that, we have to have brood stock to spawn, and the broodstock has to be ripe. Um, and then we spawn them, and they go through a swimming stage, a larval stage. It's, depending on the species, it's anywhere from about maybe eight days to about uh, 24 days. Or it could be even longer. We did sea scallops once. It took 60 days to get them to, to go through the metamorphosis. And then, well, it, it, you know, at the end of the, the larval form, the larval form, there's a swimming stage, and I'll get into a little bit about this. But then they go through a metamorphosis. You want to think, it's easier for people to think of like a caterpillar going to a butterfly. So they go from this swimming organism, and they, which has a shell, and then they lose the swimming organ, they develop a little foot, and then they settle down wherever they're going to settle, and they're kind of a miniature version of either a quahog or an oyster or a scallop. But when they're larvae, they pretty much look the same, especially early on. So they go through metamorphosis, and we have to treat them a little bit differently, each of the species. And then as they get a little bit bigger, we then grow them out as juveniles. And then, because I work with the towns, the seed gets to a certain size, and then we pass it on to each town has a shellfish constable, and then they take it and they grow it out further in some nursery culture out in the ponds. And then when it, after usually one season, sometimes longer, they plant it on the bottom, and then eventually that, those beds are open for recreational fishers or commercial fishers. <clears throat> so the, al uh, the um, algal culture, we start out with these strains of phytoplankton, again, this is microscopic algae, that um, have been selected for fast growth. Um, what, ha what happened during the energy crisis, the same, the same time when we were building the hatchery, the government was really interested in you know, trying to find fuels other than that, that petroleum. And one of the things that they looked at was the oil content of different algal species. So they selected for these species that had high levels of, of, of lipid, of, of oil, with the idea that maybe at some point they could be developed and they could be a source of energy. What happened is, you know, once that energy crisis kind of ended, everybody, everybody forgot about it, but they still had these high lipid strains. And the, the lipids, the oils in them, are actually omega-3 oils. And what they found, they did work with nutrition and found that as, as omega-3 oils, you know, are, are in fish and it's, you know, it's really good for our health, it's also good for shellfish health. So most of the species we work with were those that were selected for the high lipid content. And we're able to almost, like, maybe close to double our production because we were working with these high lipid strains. So it kind of was a, another little development from that, from the energy crisis. 
And we start out with the little flats, the little starter cultures. We work them up. We grow them in a greenhouse until in these big cultures. And then eventually, that's what we harvest to feed the shellfish. We also, um, because we're on a really rich body of water, and it's very labor intensive to grow the algae. And as the, as the shellfish get bigger, they need a lot of algae. When they're small, they, you know, a million of them you know, will fit under a microscope slide. And as they get bigger, you've got to produce all that more food. So we take advantage of the natural algal blooms. And you can see here, we've, the tank here, um, we're, we're kind of rough filtering some of the water from the pond. And you can see how much color is still in the water. That's a five micron bag, so the algae is smaller than five microns, which is a good food size for them. So for much of the uh, growth period, we don't even have to go through this business of, of um, growing the algae. We just let them eat the natural food. And at the same time, when they're eating the natural food, they're actually cleaning the water. You know that when, when, when a pond becomes really um, over rich with algae and with nutrients, you get kind of a pea soup green looking um, water. And the, the shellfish will actually you know, cleanse that and clean it, make it clear. So that's another reason to have more shellfish in the water. <clears throat> OK, so once we have the food, we can think about spawning. But we need ripe broodstock. And during the season, they usually ripen in, the, in their early, late spring, early summer. And if that's the time when we're, when we're spawning, then we can just go out and dig some cohogs that have ripe eggs, ripe sperm, and they're ready to spawn. We try to get a jump on the season, and we kind of put them in these trash barrels, um, slowly bring the temperature up on them, and feed them all the cultured food. They think they've been in the Caribbean for a couple of months, and they ripen up, and we're able to kind of get a jump on the season. So once we have that, once we have ripe brood suck, then we can think about spawning. So this is the fun part. Um, <clears throat> they basically, the shellfish, release their eggs and sperm in the water. Um, this is a picture of, of a cohog. That's a, a, a female cohog releasing eggs. And the way I know that is the eggs are a little bit larger, and they show up as like little more like particles. And if it was a male spawning, it would look more milky. It's, it's a very uh, fine. Um, small, the sperm is much smaller than the eggs. And the way we do that, in nature, they spawn in relation to a change in temperature. Like what would happen is, um, if they're ripe on a low tide, on a hot day, the sun would be coming down on them, and they would get heated up. And then as the tide comes in, the change in temperature is, offers them a, a change in temperature, a thermal stimulus that gets them, usually the males first, to release some sperm in the water. That stimulates other males. and Eventually, you have a lot of sperm being released in the water. And then the females that don't want to waste their eggs, they're like, OK, there's sperm in the water now. We'll release our eggs. So that's kind of how it happens. And, and the sper you know, it's all external out in the water. The sperm will swim to the egg, fertilize it, and then uh, an embryo develops and eventually a larvae. So the way we do it in the hatchery is we put them in these little Pyrex meatloaf dishes because with, with, they have to be in salt water. We have them in salt water. And then we run. Uh, a water bath of hot and cold water around them, and we're able to raise the temperature, cool the temperature, and eventually they, they, they release their eggs or sperm. I think that's a female oyster there on the side. One, the other thing that's interesting about them is that cohogs are pretty much either male or female. Oysters start out the first year as males, and then as they get older, they change over to females. And scallops are both male and female in the same animal. So usually, we can't just put a male and a female in a dish together because the amount of sperm release for the eggs is too much. Um, so we basically, when they start spawning, we'll segregate the males and the females. Then to a whole bucket of eggs, we'll add just a little bit of sperm, and that's usually enough. With the scallops in particular, because they're male and female, it's like really like you know we're jumping around, changing the water all the time because we want to make sure that there isn't, you can never know at one point the, the female will become the male, and the male will become a female, and they'll flip back and forth, so it kind of keeps you jumping. Uh, there's a, that's like a classic gonad picture. If you were like really into golf gonads, that's a really nice gonad. Um, and you can see, I mean, the part that, that we eat in this country is just the muscle there on the right, and then that kidney bean-shaped organ, that's the gonad. The orange is eggs, and the white part is sperm. So they. You know, when, they, when they're really ripe, that's what they'll look like. And then you know that the scallops have eyes, which makes them kind of interesting, too. I really 
enjoy working with the skulls probably most. <clears throat> so once we um, get the eggs and sperm, we mix them up in a bucket. And when we look at them under the microscope to count them, we'll see this. This is a, a fertilized egg releasing um, polar bodies. It's uh, releasing the extra genetic material. So that's the very early stages. And within like 48 hours, they have already developed a shell. You can see in the corner there, upper right-hand corner, there's um, what we call a straight hinge or D larvae because it looks like the letter D. And the, the hinge where, you know, where, the, where the clam opens, the quahog opens, is straight at that point when they're very young like that. As they get older, it rounds up a little bit, that part of it, and they, they're, they're further along in development. And throughout this procedure, we grow them in these conical tanks. So we put the eggs in, in these tanks. Um, we start feeding them the second day. Then every other day, we drain them down. We count them. We kind of thin them out. We save the faster growing ones. We put them back in the tank. And they, we go through that and feed them. You know, and that takes anywhere from, like I said, seven days to maybe 20 days, 21 days. And that's the larval period. Then at the end of the larval period, well, they have this, this little um, organ here called a vellum. So they'll stick this out, and it has little hairs on it. And the little hairs, the little cilia, they, they beat that, and that's the way they swim through the water. So even though you know this has a shell, but it opens it up, the shell, and then they're light. And by, by beating those little hairs, they, they swim around in the water. And this is also the way they feed. They use the cilia to catch their, the little microscopic algae that they're going to eat. And then when they go through the metamorphosis, well, here's just a shot of the drain down. Um, you can see this, these are, this is an oyster larvae. It's getting, they get more distinctive. They're, they're, these are bigger. But you see it still has the vellum, it still has the little hairs. And when we look at them through the microscope, even though they have a shell, you can look through the shell, it's clear. And if they're feeding well, the, most of the algae is like this yellow, you know, golden color. We can actually look into them and watch them. You can actually watch the stomach grinding down the food. It's really interesting. But that's what gives them the color when we drain them down on a sieve. And then, as I said, they go through a metamorphosis. Um, this is a picture of a skull going here. But this is a swimming stage. And then you'll see they lose this swimming organ. And they start developing a little foot. This is kind of the start of the foot. And then they go through the metamorphosis. They, don't, they can't even feed for a little while. We have to make sure they have a lot of food stores on them before they go into this, because there's like maybe a day or two when you know, they, they, they lose that ability to feed, and they haven't developed. These are the gills developing here. And the gills will ha also have cilia on them, and they will take the place of the vellum to catch the food. And you can see on this scalp, it's actually opening up like a scalp. This is the little lobes of the, of the um, gills. And then this is in great picture, but there's a little foot there coming out. So they basically cease being a swimming organism, and they become just a miniature version of, of what they are. So instead of growing them in the tanks, we put them on these sieves, and we pump water over the top of them. So they're either got recirculated water here, or they have just a trickle flow of water from the pond going to them. And it's a little labor intensive because you have them on these sieves, and what has to happen is after about a week, these sieves start getting dirty, and the water won't go through them, and we have to take them off the sieves. And if you can see in this picture here, you, there's a 21-day-old scalp. See how delicate that thing is? So we have to be really careful. We usually let them dry out a little bit, and they fall off. And then we run them through a series of sieves so we can divide up the sizes. Because if you have little ones and big ones together, the big ones will take all the food, and the little ones will either die or not develop. So we segregate out the sizes. So we have the big ones together and, this, and, and remove the little ones so the little ones have a chance to develop. But, and then we, at the end, we have to actually use a, a little paintbrush and just gently mark, uh, wash, wipe them off to get them off. So it's, it's pretty labor intensive. And then as they get bigger, we can increase the size of the bags. You saw in the beginning we were using a 5 micron bag. This is a 50 micron bag, so it's letting more food through. We've got a more of a flow, and the animals are bigger. These are, this is, again, scallops. And then as they get bigger yet, we move them to these things called upweller silos. These don't, don't work that well for scallops, but for this is blue mussels here, and these are oysters. And the way this works, it's called an upweller because we don't have to use a filter then. Instead of having the filter bag, 
the water comes into the tank here, and these have a mesh bottom. And in order to go out, the water has to go through them and out. This is the exit. So it kind of saves us the problem of, of washing those bags every day. Because when we're running the thing, we have 30 or 40 bags. The kids that work there, we call them bag people. And um, they clean the bags every day. And then scallops lend themselves to uh, what they call raceway culture because they attach themselves with the little threads that they have. And we grow them in tanks like this, and then they'll spread themselves out. This is uh, 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 35 days old. They start developing color, and you start seeing the first eyes developing. And like I said, they attach to the, to the tables, but they still, we get silt and fecal material. So these tanks have to be, we have to rinse that silt out of there every day. So one of the things is um, we try to, because we're producing millions of these things. And if you're doing you know, 100,000, it's fine. You can put them in cages and go through all this trouble and have them on the tables. But the idea is we're producing millions of these. How do we, how do we handle them and get them out in the field in a more efficient labor, less labor intensive method? And we've come up with this method of putting them on. This is burlap. We also use little pieces of uh, cheesecloth. And they, they like to attach to things. So this is what, what it looks like to the naked eye. This is a, you know, a piece, of, piece of burlap, and we, we sprinkled some scallops on it. And they like to attach to it. In nature, they would attach to eelgrass and other things. But you get some idea. That's the, th that's the threads of the, of the burlap there. And you can see how they're all stuck on there. And then, so we came up with a method to put them in a little, little like, um, well, it's in a piece of tissue paper. And we make a little bundle. And then, because when they're out of water, they'll drop off. So if we were to just take this in and then try to transfer it to, to the field, they'll, they'll drop off. So we put them in the, little, uh, mesh, in the little tissue paper bags. And when we put the, that out, they, once they get, they get back in the water, they, they stick again. And then we put them in actually in these different little net bags to grow them out. Um, so we've come up with an efficient way to get millions of them out in the field without too much labor. <clears throat> we also grow oysters. As I said, you know, we can grow single oysters which is kind of what the private aquaculture guys grow, because you want to have the best money you're going to get for oysters is on the half shell. And you want to have single oysters that are beautiful shaped and they're deep cupped. And um, they don't naturally really want to grow as singles. They want to grow as, as clusters. But so we, we do produce some um, single oysters. And the way we do that, again, this is, this is larvae that's getting ready to set. And what's interesting, they get a little, the oysters get this little eye spot you look at under the microscope. But they also, just to the naked eye, they start sticking to each other. And they get kind of, we call it snotty. They make these little, you know, mucus tricks things. And you know then that it's time to move them. The thing with oysters is scallops will develop a foot and they'll crawl around. And then, you know, they never really cement anything. The problem with oysters is once they go through the metamorphosis, they'll crawl for a short period of time. And then wherever they are, they're going to cement. And once they cement, they're on there. You know, if they, if they cement inside the tank, you know, you have to scrape them off and kill them to get the, get the tank clean. So we, we have to be very conscious of when they're getting really ready to set and provide them with some hard surface that we can move around to set them on. And when we do the single oysters, we've come up with this method of using, a lot of times they just use ground up um, oyster shell. But we went through a lot of blenders trying to grind oyster shell down to about 300 microns, because you want, if you want to have a single oyster, an oyster is about um, 250 microns at the size. So you, don't, you want to give them a piece of, of chip that's only going to allow one of them to stick. Um, because you get two, then it's like, you know, they're not a single oyster anymore. So we basically grind down. We found oyster shell, our poultry shell works just as well, and it doesn't burn up the blenders. And we sieve it so it's about 300 microns. We put it in, a, in a, one of these um, downweller sieves. And then sprinkle the oysters over it. And you get, get some idea. This is 300 micron or thereabouts uh, poultry shell. And there's the oysters that have kind of settled on. And then they go through the metamorphosis and they, they stick to those pieces of shell and they grow. And then they're kind of a single oyster because we can move them around and they're on these little pieces of the poultry shell. For stock and heat, well, you get another pig. This, are, you know, this is oh, a couple of days later, they grow like really fast. And look at how much, how much bigger they are than those little pieces, of those little chips now. They've grown over them. Um, so this is always exciting to look at this under the microscope. Um, we also do um, spat on shell. If we're doing stock enhancement work, we put oysters out basically for 
wild oyster reefs. Um, if you do single ones, you really have to protect them. And that's what the growers do, the private growers. If you were to put them, the single ones out, they're, they're not protected very well. And, and, and it's interesting, you can actually watch the crabs. The crabs will pick them up like, like potato chips and just chew on them. Whereas if they're attached to a shell, it's harder for the crab to get hold of them. So what we do is this stuff called spat on shell. And we have these bags that we um, fill with old shell. Any kind of shell will work. We, we, we use uh, scallop shell a lot. And then there's the larvae. There's probably a million uh, oysters there in that little bag. So we have this tank with the, with the bags of shell in it, and we sprinkle that stuff in. And in just several days, and we aerate it, and in several days, they settle down on the shells. They cement themselves to the shell. And after you know, several weeks or so, this is what they look like. And this is individual, what we call oyster spat at this point, that they stick to the shell. And that's oyster spat on a, on a scallop shell. And then, again, we work with the shellfish constable. So whatever we produce eventually goes to them. They, they, you know, they're on my board. We work together. And they take the seed. This is bags of uh, cohog seed. About um, two millimeters is what we give them. And there's, you know, there's 100,000 per bag, because we give them you know, millions of these things. And then they have different methods. There's floating sandboxes and other ways to protect them until they get a, bit, a little bit larger. Um, um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we can produce millions and millions of seed, but if we don't have clean water, we're really wasting our time because we throw them out there and they're not going to make it because of, of oxygen issues. One of our biggest problems, again, is algal blooms. And the algal blooms can take the shape of, this is a rust tide. I don't know if you have any, much of it here, but it's, in recent years, this has been a real problem. It's not toxic all the time. It, it's toxic to shellfish. Not all the time, but sometimes it is. And it can, it can I mean, when it's in the water, sometimes the scallops won't spawn. Um, the larvae dies. Um, oysters die. There's been a lot. And this is kind of new to the area. And it used to just show up in August, and we're, we're finding it now in May sometimes. So it's, you know, if we don't have water to grow these things, it's, it's going to be a problem. Um, and then the other algae we deal with is, is macroalgae, which is big algae or seaweed. This is from in front of my hatchery um, and how bad it can get. This used to be, when I first came 40 years ago, this was clean water. It was a rocky bottom. And now this is kind of what we get every year almost. And it's this, this nutrient, it's nitrogen mostly coming from septic systems. So the more development we have on the island, and we've, we've gone through explosive growth on the island so that all this nitrogen gets in the groundwater. And then even though you know, a, a septic system will will filter out the bacteria that might be a health issue for us, it doesn't control the, the nutrient, the nitrogen, which is a fertilizer. So we're essentially like, you're almost like fertilizing your lawn and putting all this nitrogen in the pond. And you know, algae is a good thing up to a point because they eat it, but it, if you add so much that it overwhelms the system, you end up with this kind of thing. And, and there's, there's good evidence that these micro blooms, the, 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 this kind of rust tide thing, is also associated with the high nutrients. So we deal with many ways we try to help with trying to reduce the nitrogen. One of the, the really innovative things we've been playing around with, and we got an EPA grant to do this, uh, this is the, uh, an invasive reed, um, Phragmites, which you probably have it grow here. It likes to grow in very high nitrogen and where the soil is disturbed. So when you have an area that, that has a lot of development and it's been disturbed, you're going to get Phragmites. And the Phragmites is like a, like a sponge for the, for the nitrogen. It'll soak up the nitrogen. And we, we've done all kinds of you know, really intense testing on this. And it absorbs like a lot of nitrogen. So the question is, right now, you know, it blooms, and then it dies, and, and the nitrogen goes back. But if we can harvest that, that um, the, the Phragmites, when we harvest it, the nitrogen is in it you know, when it's green. And then if we can do something with that, either use it for compost or feed it to <clears throat> you know, um, livestock or whatever, we can get the nitrogen out of the pond. So this is one of the innovative things we've been doing. Another really important thing is to educate the public. A lot of people don't know that you know, they fertilize their lawn and they don't know what kind of impacts those are going to have. Um, so we put together this booklet a number of years ago. Um, we patterned it after uh, West Coast publication. 
And it basically is a, an attempt to educate people about their everyday activities with, with regard to nutrients, but also with you know, pesticides, with um, you know, any number of contaminants like you know, oil running off your cars or your boat and whatever, just so that people are aware and try to do the right thing to protect the water. Because again, if, if we're really concerned about you know, looking out for our shellfish resources, we need to have clean water. And if we don't have clean water, you know, that's step number one. Um, so it's, it's a battle, but I think, you know, the more people are educated about what they should do and what they shouldn't do, um, you know, we can all play a little part in, in helping that. Um, again, we do a little bit of um, habitat um, work. Again, um, our eelgrass is very important to, um, uh, to, well, to many species, but especially to, to bay scallops. Um, we've lost almost, God, probably 80% of our eelgrass beds on the island, mostly due to nutrients. Again, um, this is a green plant. If the water gets that pea green color, the light will not penetrate, and this, this really important um, seagrass won't grow. And once the seagrass isn't there, there's no place and for the scallops to kind of hang out and be protected from the crabs and other predators, and we'll lose the scallops. The other thing is shell recycling. As I mentioned earlier, that especially in areas that have oysters, uh, we have to provide something for the oysters to attach to. Um, when oysters are harvested and the shells are taken away and not put back in the pond, we're essentially removing oyster habitat. So we, we work with um, a lot of the restaurants on the island, and we, you know, once a week or twice a week, um, this is Allie, she's really proud because that's her big pile. Um, uh, she collects these shells from the restaurants every week, and we, and we store them, and then they have to age for a little while, and then we put them in the pond, and that will provide habitat for oysters. And then on top of it, um, you know about you know, acid rain and um, how that's changing the pH, the acidity of seawater. Um, the nice thing about shells is they're, they're basically tums. They're tum tablets, so because they're, car they're calcium carbonate. So if you have a problem with, say, the mud on the bottom of a pond being acidic, and there's, there's many studies that have shown that, um, actually, the work I'm thinking about is, is, was done in Maine with softshell clams. The softshell clams, if they settle down, instead of having a nice, clean, sandy bottom, rocky bottom, they settle down into some mud from the algae that died that's all acidic, the shells actually dissolve. So these little microscopic shellfish, they're trying to settle down, and it's so acidic that they dissolve. And it's going to, you know, with, with acid rain and all those issues, um, that's going to become more and more of a problem. So putting the shell back, again, helps to kind of, you know, a little bit of acid relief for the oceans. And then I think I might have just one more to mention. Uh, I can go on about all of this stuff, but in 1995 we did the, you know, this um, private aquaculture initiative where we worked with fishermen who were forced out of work because of closures on George's Bank because the fish were being over, um, over harvested. And our idea was that, you know, if the fish, the product isn't out there, let's help them grow their own. So they, and, and we have, like I said, about 30 farms now where many of the people are, for, most of them are former fishermen who have basically given up on some of the wild fishery, or some of them do it part-time, but um, the more they get into this and realize that they can actually farm their own seafood, um, that's kind of what they're doing. And I think the last shell is just, um, again, you know, I got 40 years worth of stuff here. I can't, I can't cover it in this talk, but if you want to go on to, or we have an active Facebook page and we have a website where you can read a lot more about that. So hope I didn't go too long. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Yeah, sure. Yeah, there's um, actually, oh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> yeah. The question was, um, how many people are involved in the actual operation of the hatchery, if that's correct, right? Um, and we basically have, um, right now, we have, we have the three facilities, but one is only in the summer. So we have two facilities, and we have, um, basically, there's three year-round people now. We're looking at a fourth one. And in the summer, when we get really busy, we're busy from about April till 
uh, at the end of August. Same as, you know, here. So we get a lot of students and we get interns and, and we'll have probably, oh, maybe another six or 10. And then on top of it, we're working with all the shellfish constables and some of them have summer assistants also. So, you know, it's pretty labor intensive, but the hatchery itself um, runs on about, you know, in the summertime, maybe about six people. And that's two facilities. And it's some and it's seven days a week. <laughs> that's that's a tough part. But you're a farmer, you know, the, the cows have to get milked. Yes. The question is, is there anything we produce go off island? Um, I would say a little bit. The, the, um, we've been approached about selling more of our seed off island. The thing is, we're pretty much, um, you know, the, the, the local tax dollars and whatever grants we can get pretty much um, cover our budget. So the idea is that what we produce, and we don't give them a specific number. We say, you know, some years it's going to be really good. Sometimes, you know, it's like a crop. Sometimes it's not a good crop and you're not going to get as much as you got the year before. But so everybody, the ta all the towns kick in some tax dollars. So we pretty much try to keep it on the island. Um, we will provide, we, we have supplied small amounts to researchers. It's amazing how many, I mean, we're right across the water from Woods Hole. And, you know, there's top researchers there, but they don't have access to, you know, they, they want oyster seed that's four days old. So, you know, we'll make an arrangement. And it's usually small amounts that go to them. And as, you know, as someone told me very early on, especially, you know, they're stingy about their shellfish. Um, you know, they don't really, we have six towns on the island. When I first came, I was kind of like, well, this town's got more seed than they should have. It's going to stunt. Let's take some of it and move it. Oh, no, 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 you won't do that. And somebody sat, sat me down once and said, look, you're on the vineyard. These people, some of these people sooner share their spouses than their scallops. <laughs> So that's kind of, you know, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, so I mean, we, we, we do provide a little bit off island, but for the most part, it stays there. Yeah, you have a question. Yeah. Is there any way that you're actually talking to the community about the island? Okay, the question is is there any area where there's natural propagation that is viable? Yes, we do have, I mean, there's natural sets going on. What we produce in the hatchery is just a small part of what is happening out there. Um, like if we're going to have a really good scallop here, it's not going to be because of my scallops. It's because conditions were right for the natural stuff to happen too. So that's, that's really, and that all ties into the water quality stuff. But, but with scallops, you, you, you may not be aware, but they have a very short lifespan. They only live like, you know, two years, sometimes into the third year. So if for some reason conditions aren't right one year and the scallops don't develop, then the next year conditions might be perfect, but there's no brood stock because the brood stock, you know, you, de you depend upon each year class for the brood stock for the next. So one of the things I think that we do that's very important is that we make sure that even in a bad year, there's going to be some brood stock that we're putting out there. So even if it's not enough to be um, an amount that's going to really affect you know, a major harvest, at least the next year, if conditions are right, there'll be animals there to take advantage of that. And then we do do a lot of, we do management in the ponds. We, we put these things all called, called um, scallop sanctuaries, where if there's not many scallops around, you know, if there's a scallop over here and a scallop over here, and, you know, you've got to get the sperm from that one to the eggs of that one, what is the chance of this happening if there are not many around? So we'll collect them up and, and put them in a cage where they're close together, and we put them in the surface water so it kind of stimulates, simulates what we're doing on the spawning table with the hot and cold. So, you know, you know when you swim how, you know, the sun's out and it's warm at the surface and then it gets cool. So we try to almost, you know, look at what's happening on the spawning table that gets them to spawn and let's try to duplicate that out in nature. So we'll put these cages out and the animals are close together. So if they do spawn, the chance of the sperm making it to the egg so, you know, there's stuff like that that can happen, and we do do that. And even just putting shell out to collect the natural stock of, say, oysters. If we, did, if we didn't put the shell in the pond, the oysters might be spawning, but, you know, they don't have anything to settle on. They're settling in the mud. So this gives them, you know, hard surface. So, yeah, it isn't just the hatchery. There's other things, too. But like I said, 
Um, this talk was pretty much concentrated on hatchery stuff. Yeah, in the back. <laughs> the question is, um, is the brute stock that we work with um, selected for different traits? Um, we do work with, again, like I said, we try to work with our local stocks as much as possible. But because the, um, the, a lot of the local stocks are slower growing, and a lot of the stocks that have been selected at different hatcheries are faster growing, we try to kind of use a little bit of both. So we'll cross some hatchery stock that we know are fast growing with other stocks that are nat you know, natural to the area that, that we're sure have disease resistant. And, and you know, the plan is that we're getting the best of both worlds. We have an, we have an important um, wampum industry on the island. We have people who make wampum jewelry. And um, they would like to see our, our cohogs that we're putting out there have more purple in them. We're actually in the process of a, of a grant proposal to see if we can understand, you know, is it genetics or what does that? And you, know, you, and you can do a lot of things. I mean, we were talking over, over dinner about the fact that we have all different kinds of colored scallops. When I came up from Virginia, they were all brown. And I came up and I saw orange ones and white ones and yellow ones. And you know, when you run a hatchery, it's like playing God. You know? So it's kind of like, let's make orange scallops. Let's do orange scallops with white lines, white stripes on them. So you know, for many years, I got to play around with that. The orange ones we found, um, even though they are very rare, it's a dominant gene. And we were working with them at first. And it was good because it was good PR for us because we were able to um, tell the fishermen that they were coming in and, and with more iron scallops. And we said, yeah, that's what we're doing. We're putting iron. And they said, wow, this is really great. And then we were shut down for a little while while we were building the new hatchery. And they were still getting a lot of iron scallops. And we weren't putting, because we had, we had changed the color frequency out in nature a little bit. But then we did some other work at the previous lab where I worked. There was a woman who was a, a shellfish geneticist. And she looked at the, the genes of these and the genetics of these things. And actually, the orange was a dominant gene. So the question is, if it's a dominant gene, why is it only 1.5% of the population? And then she had a graduate student come up, and they sampled the wild population on the vineyard when they were really tiny and as they got bigger, the same area. And when they were really young, there were lots of white ones, there were lots of yellow ones, lots of orange ones. And as the population aged, they were more brown. And her hypothesis was that these bright ones on a mud bottom stuck out, stood out to predators, and the predators picked them off. So, you know, you, when you start playing God, you got to like figure out what's going. So we, 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 what we've been doing lately is there are some striped scallops. And we have lots of skunks on the vineyard. So we called them, our, we, we grew a, a strain of striped scallops, which you call vineyard skunks. And, um, and again, we haven't done the research, but in an eelgrass bed, we think the striping probably offers them some camouflage advantage. Yes, you. Okay, let's see if I can get this quick. I've just got to repeat this now. The, the question is um, that the work that we're doing is important to both the planet as things are existing now and also what benefit and how it, has it brought the community together in any way. Um, one of the things I can say is that Mars Vineyard is six, six towns and we have a regional high school and it, the regional high school took like forever to get together because each town is different, and they don't want to give up their, I mean, we have six police forces. We have six fire departments. It's nuts. But, um, but what's, what, what's interesting about the shellfish thing, the shellfish was enough of a thing. I mean, the reason that that program exists, I think, is because old-time islanders remember what it used to be like. And I mean, there's, a, there's like a reverence for shellfish just because it's been so much of their culture. And so I, I, you know, I arrived as this, you know, biologists that they thought had a magic wand and could just, you know, they learned that that wasn't true. But that, that, that somebody would concentrate on that. And we have this, you know, it's, it's an organization of, of six towns. And we're one of the, we were one of the first really successful regional programs on the island because 
it kind of gives people hope. And I mean, we're still not at a point where I can move some scholars from this town to that town if they have too many. But um, but no, it's worked out well. It's um, and and as I, 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 as we were talking over dinner, um, one of the things about the shellfish group when I started, we had like nothing, and we started because Massachusetts is pretty interesting. We have a state, you know, Department of Marine Fisheries that oversees all of the fishing and everything, but the uh, Massachusetts is, is, is all town-based. So each town has a shellfish console, each town has a shellfish uh, department, um, and they have the ultimate say within the state limits. You know, the state could say, okay, well, the state will say, okay, you can have aquaculture, but if the town doesn't want aquaculture, then it doesn't happen. So um, the fact that they have the local control I think, you know, gives them a little bit more control over what's going on. But we're able to build, we were able to build this kind of from the bottom up. It's not like the state coming down and saying, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to do this. We started very, you know, with nothing. And we brought, when we brought people along, we brought them all along. So now we've got this base of support. So the shellfish group, you know, at this point, it, you know, if, if there's some issue and the shellfish group takes a stand on a pier or on, you know, a development or whatever, we carry some weight. It's like amazing because they know, they know, and the same thing with aquaculture. Um, you know, we kind of got the aquaculture started and, and we educated the whole entire community as we went along as to the value of this. And we, well, we had, we did lots of oyster aquaculture and then we, we branched out into, um, we have a couple of, they're not, haven't been too successful yet, mussel farms, a little bit offshore. And when the newspaper articles came out about the proposal, it was all about, wow, we, they did, you know, aquaculture's done these wonderful things for the oysters in, you know, in the ponds. What can, we can only imagine what, how great it's going to be to have our own cultured mussels. So, you know, the, the whole attitude about aquaculture has been pretty positive. And again, it's like constant, constant um, education of the public and the community. So, no, and we have, you know, we have fundraisers and you know, people come out, they love us. It's great. So it took a long time, but it but it but it's been good. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It was a little rocky. Um, first of all, I had done this for you know since nineteen seventy six and I always felt like the buck stops here. Oh, my question was, well, I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question, but um, it was um, the transition, I'm emeritus now, and how did that, you know, I move from emeritus and, and move other people in? So um, I've had a lot of people work for me, you know, some longer than others. Um, and, and, and like I said, I was a bit of control freak because I did this for all these years, and I always felt that the buck stopped with me. And, you know, all it takes is like one person, you know, and we've had this happen in one of the facilities. Somebody forgot to put the, the standpipe in the, you know, and, and the water came on and the animals all dried out because they didn't, you know. So I would be like the, the, the nervous Nelly. I would, you know, not leave until the last person left and then I would check all the flows. And um, so then what happened with, um, I mean, I stepped down and there were, there were two co-directors, two women that had worked for me, and they were co-directors for a while. There was, then there was a little bit of a power battle, and one of them took over. But, but what happened was, um, in, in the, the year of the pandemic, I was still working like two days a week. You know, when the, when the article came out that I retired, it was kind of like, well, at least semi retired. And, you know, it's been my life, so it isn't something you give up really easily. But um, when the pandemic hit, I had really bad asthma, and I just said, you know, gang, I'm not coming in. You know, you're going to have to handle this. And lo and behold, they handled it fine. They had a good year, and I was kind of like, oh, the cord's cut now. You know, they don't need me. So it's, um, and it's, you know, it's going on. It's, it's doing well. So, and that way, you know, it's my baby, and it's not something I, you know, the last thing I want to see is like 40 years just go down the drain because it's not handled properly. So, and it's continuing, and it's, and it's doing well. So I'm, I'm thrilled, and now I take some time off. <laughs> Visit Block Island for the first time. <laughs> yes.
okay, the question is, in in a in a in a, in a say an individual uh, uh, salt pond, um, if you have different species growing or being cultured, like if you were to do kelp or to do oysters and do you know scallops, um, it, you know, is there a competition? Well, obviously, um, you know, they're all eating this this natural phytoplankton. So there's a point at which if you had a lot of them in there, they might they might compete. I mean, I've seen where we get sets of scallops sometimes where they stunt because there's just not enough food for them. And like I said, I suggested we move some of them to another town to thin them out, and like, we're not doing that. But, um, but with individual species, um, there is some competition, but a lot of times, like scallops prefer like a larger phytoplankton, and, and, the, and the quahogs like a smaller phytoplankton. So, you know, they, they kind of live together. I mean, I mean, you could see if you have a lot of blue mussels, it might, if they covered the bottom, it might cause the problem for, say, soft shell clams. So yeah, there, there's some issues. But I mean, what, what we're trying to do with aquaculture now is to look at, I mean, we, you know, biologists all want to play God, because we look at this wonderful system of nature. And you know, how can we duplicate this? And you know, the bottom line is we're never going to do this totally. But we try to, you know, we move in that direction. And the, the latest thing with, um, with aquaculture is to try to grow species together. And one of the things is that, that, well, they grow salmon, and then the waste products of the salmon can create a phytoplankton bloom, which then if you're growing oysters there, they'll feed on that. And then the oysters waste product is, is, is basically a nitrogen product, but it's ammonia, and, and kelp really likes ammonia. So if you were to, if you're to grow these crops together, you, you know, it's not a monoculture like a cornfield. It's more like a natural prairie. So, you know, we're trying to duplicate nature as best we can. And I, you know, we're moved that direction. So um, they, can, they can exist together. But I mean, you, you know, you have to be careful. I mean, and there's, there are usually regulations and there's lots of studies about, you know, how many oysters can you grow in an area before you're going to start having some negative impacts. But for the most part, shellfish, you know, they clean the water. That's, they're, they're like, probably the greenest protein you can eat. Um, when you look at carbon, they're, um, I think we're, they do even better than potatoes, you know? So it's like, and they're protein. So I mean, we can grow shellfish, oysters, and do less damage to the environment than we can to a field of potatoes. So, and then, you know, I got into this stuff and it was just basically many years ago when we were just growing to put more fish out there for the fishermen. And over the years, you know, we found out how important they are about cleaning up the water, how important they are for removing nitrogen, how important they are um, as a food. I mean, they're, they're super healthy food to eat. Um, and then they're just like the most efficient protein. So it's kind of like, you know, in, in, a, in a future world, if we all ate like more shellfish, we would be in much better shape. And, and with the population increasing, I mean, we're probably going to go that way. And there's not that anything too bad about eating more scallops and oysters, as far as I'm concerned. Yes. How come no ocean scallops? Um, we did grow ocean scallops once under a grant. Um, the, scallop, the ocean scallops, they grow offshore in colder water. And so we're growing these in the bay. And we grew them, we did this one spawn we did under this grant, and we spawned them in February. We had to keep the windows open to keep it, you know, the greenhouse cold enough for them. And because they're colder, usually the colder they are, the longer they take to grow. And it was, it was like 40 days. I think, I think we, we spawned them on Ash Wednesday, and I think they went through metamorphosis on Easter. You know, it was like, whereas usually these other species, I mean, uh, base golfs, it's only like eight or 10 days they start going through a metamorphosis. So, from the standpoint of that, it's difficult. Um, in Maine, where it's colder inshore waters, they are actually culturing sea scallops, you know, inshore. And, but because, I mean, they're, they're doing, there's a little bit of, of scallop hatchery work going on, but it's just so, it, it takes so long that they, they usually get most of their seed, they collect it. So they put out these, you know, different bags or something that will collect the little tiny seed, and then they take the seed, and then they grow that out, rather than start at a hatchery. But the, I mean, the thing about the hatchery is you can start selecting 
for fast growth, selecting for disease resistance. So the value in a hatchery is also to improve the stocks. And eventually, if the sea scallop aquaculture becomes more important, um, we'll probably you know, see more development of sea scallop hatcheries. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't mention soft shell clams because, first of all, we only have so much, so many hours in the hatchery and months to do this. And um, the soft shells are kind of a little bit lower on the, on the demand end for the vineyard, at least. Um, we have grown them a little bit. There was a hatchery associated with Salem State College that produced quite a bit. And we would buy some, so the shellfish consoles were, you know, that was available from them. So they would buy it. So the question was whether, why, I don't, why we don't do soft shell clams. And the other thing is the soft shell clams, we do sometimes get really heavy sets of them, just naturally. We'll see like an area where the sand has been scoured a little bit and, it's, and if there's an eddy, it helps to kind of settle out the seed. And sometimes you can just go there and collect huge amounts of the small seed to plant out. But no, I think if we had a bigger facility and more time, we, we would do soft shells also. I mean, one of the species we're working on now um, is actually something that's not eaten. It's the marsh mussel, the rib mussel. And if you've ever eaten them, they taste awful. But the thing is, they're incredible for in cleaning up the environment. They just, they filter, they filter out actually bacteria. They're just incredible, you know, for improving water quality. And as a result, um, there's a demand for them. I mean, we, we and we, I mean, we, I'm a little cocky because I've grown all these things. It's like, yeah, sure, we'll grow these. And we've had a rough time. Those have been difficult to grow. We're, we're, we're making some advances in it, but we, um, there's areas of, of like the Hudson River, uh, places near uh, LaGuardia Airport, where they're trying to improve the water quality. Even like the, the what is it, East River in New York. And they're trying to put these, because um, they're inedible, so you don't have to worry about somebody accidentally getting sick because they won't eat them. But they, they can clean up the water. So there's... As I said, you know, when I got into it, this was just really to eat. And now we know that, you know, we can grow them to improve habitat, we can grow them to improve water quality. And that particular species is like really important to clean up the water. And when we get the bugs out of that, I think there's gonna be a huge demand to put those in for, for cleaning water. I mean, there's a story that they talk, tell about the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I, I, that's where I kind of got started in this business. And like, in the heyday of the, of the oysters in the Chesapeake Bay, there were enough oysters, because they filter somewhere up to maybe 50 gallons a day, depending on size and temperature uh, of the water. But um, they, they calculated that there were enough oysters in Chesapeake Bay that every two and a half, three and a half days, the volume of the Chesapeake Bay was filtered through oysters. And the water used to be really clean, and there used to be lots of eelgrass, and there were lots of crabs that hung out in the eelgrass. And then there was overfishing in the, the you know, the, the 1890s, beginning of the, of the uh, 20th century. And, and then they, there was also a number of diseases, so that the number of oysters in the, in the Chesapeake Bay now is, a, is minuscule compared to what it used to be. And what used to take, you know, water quality um, filtration, which used to take two and a half, three and a half days, now takes over a year. That's how few oysters there are. So, a lot of the push in Chesapeake Bay to put oysters back in the Chesapeake Bay isn't only to eat them, it's to clean the water because we know how important they are. And then also, you know, oyster, oyster reefs, natural oyster bars are essentially uh, a temporal um, uh, or, uh, coral reef. They have all the little nooks and crannies and all kinds of critters live in them and, you know, and they feed other fish that, you know, prey on, or you know, larger fish that prey on them and larger fish that are sport fish. So the oyster reefs are, are similar to coral reef in terms of just increasing the biodiversity and, and improving the habitat too. So that's another reason why oysters are going back. And, and even like the aquaculture stuff, they've done work where they show that even having an oyster cage out there versus having nothing there. I mean, the guys that grow oysters on the island, you know, they'll pull up their cages, there's lobsters hanging out in there, there's eels, there's all kinds of fish around there. In an area that never had any lobsters around it, after they put these cages down, the lobstermen all have their, their pots around the farm because 
that, that structure is providing habitat for other critters that attracts the lobsters. So there's more than, they're, they're more than just to eat, I guess is what I want to say. Okay. There is, there is. I mean, especially with oysters. Oysters, oysters start. Oh, I'm sorry. The question is, um, um, here on Block Island and, and elsewhere, is there an issue with people who um, say buy some oysters, say maybe the fish market or somewhere, and they're not from here, and they think they're doing a good thing by throwing them out in the water, um, and really, the, there is a, a disease potential for the oysters. Um, I mean, the nice thing about oysters is. They're really easy, the aquaculture, you can bang them around, I mean, but the thing is that they do have a lot of diseases, and some of the, the biologists think that the reason why there's so many diseases is that they've been able to be moved around so much, so we've, we've, you know, we've moved these diseases all over the place. So the thing is that, um, I mean, before we can put our seed from the hatchery in the water, we have to have it tested to make sure that, I mean, it's never 100%, but, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, it's not contaminated before we can put it in an area. And what happens is, you know, when you go to a fish market or even a restaurant, maybe they've got oysters from somewhere else. And shell recycling is good, but you have to, you have to age the shell out of water for about a year, oysters, before you put it back to make sure that if there's any diseases associated with that, you know, you put them back. We never had we never had dermo disease, which is a, a, a disease of oysters on the island. And then it showed up. And I remember we, we did fundraising stuff, and we were selling boat raffle tickets one night. And these people came, and they, they had been, they'd come up from Virginia. And they said, oh, yeah, we brought a couple of bushels of oysters from, you know, with us. And we got them hanging off our dock. And it's like, no! You know? <laughs> so, yeah, no, it, you know, yeah, you can't, don't, sometimes you try to do something good, and it's not what you want to do. I think I'm getting the hook. Thank you so much for listening on a really hot night. Well, Rick's not going anywhere. He'll be here for a while, whether he wants to be or not. We have some refreshments in the back, and please feel free to, to ask Mr. Carney some more questions. Thank you so much for coming.